If you're just joining me, we're about to start the active reading step of this passage as we go through the SQ3R method. So in the previous video, we surveyed the questions, we surveyed the passage, we asked ourselves, what is the question that this passage is trying to answer? Happens to be right there in the blurb and the title of the, of the passage, which is, can economics be ethical? Now it's time for the three R's, reading, reciting, and reviewing. So what this means, as I proceed through this passage, as I read it aloud to you, I'm also going to be reciting back the ideas that are presented in the passage in its own words. This is a very powerful technique because when you synthesize an idea from the passage, when you say it in your own words, when you recite it, you are demonstrating your understanding of it. So as we go through this passage, I'm going to be circling claims, arguments, big ideas. Uh, in the first step, in the survey step, I already circled a couple of names. Here I'm going to be circling Claims made by the author, I'm going to be circling contrast words, conjunctions like but or yet, or adverbs like instead or however. I want to focus in on those, see where the hinges of this argument are and where things pivot. All right, so let's get going. Let's commence the reading. Paragraph one. Recent debates about the economy have rediscovered the question, is that right, where right means more than just profits or efficiency? Okay, so this is basically our topic sentence of the passage. It's reintroducing the idea of ethics into, into business, basically. That's what they're talking about with profits or efficiency here. Uh, is, is doing business right more than just making money or doing your work efficiently? Let's move on to paragraph two. Some argue... That because the free markets allow for personal choice, they are already ethical. Well, there's an argument right there. I'm going to underline it and flag it. Let me say that back. Because you can make choices in a free market, this argument is saying you are free to make ethical choices. Others have accepted the ethical critique and embraced corporate social responsibility. Now, I see that I've underlined embraced, and I've written question four here. If this were test day, I would hop right over to question four and answer this question to see how embraced was being used in context, but I'm not going to do that today. So, okay, so we have one claim here. Free markets are already ethical. We have another claim here, which is that corporate Social responsibility is a counterpoint against the idea that free markets are already ethical. But, here we go with the but, before we can label any market outcome as immoral or sneer at economists who try to put a price on being ethical, we need to be clear on what we're talking about. So before we go any further, let's get to some definitions, is what I think the author is trying to say. Now, I will note that what I'm doing here, making these annotations, is not something that, as of this video, you can currently do in our product. So, as you are doing practice, if you feel the need to note something down, keep a little pad of paper and, and a pencil or a pen next to your device. Line 10, paragraph 3. There are different views on where ethics should apply when someone makes an economic decision. All right, so let's keep an, uh, a lookout for what those different views might be. The paragraph is setting up this idea that there's going to be a bunch of different ideas clashing with each other. Consider Adam Smith, widely regarded as the founder of modern economics. He was a moral philosopher who believed sympathy for others was the basis for ethics. We would call it empathy nowadays. All right, we're talking about economics, we're talking about moral philosophy, we're talking about sympathy and empathy. Now, these are a lot of complex ideas, uh, but I will say that you don't have to have outside knowledge of Adam Smith or economics or moral philosophy in order to do well on the SAT. Everything you need to do well on this passage is contained within this passage, and more importantly, it's contained within you. Yeah! All we need to do is go through this passage and restate it in our own words, and that gives us control over it. You don't scare me, passage in a discipline I know little about. Now, um, back to the passage. So, Adam Smith was a moral philosopher who believed sympathy for others was the basis for ethics. We would call it empathy nowadays. I've underlined empathy because it's important. But... Circle the butt. One of his key insights in The Wealth of Nations, that's his book, was that acting on this empathy could be counterproductive. Interesting. He observed people becoming better off when they put their own empathy aside and interacted in a self-interested way. That does seem kind of counterintuitive. 
Let's keep reading. Smith justifies selfish behavior by the outcome. Whenever planners use cost-benefit analysis to justify a new railway line, or someone retrains to boost his or her earning power, or a shopper buys one to get one free, they are using the same approach, empathizing with someone and seeking an outcome that makes that person as well off as possible, although the person they are empathizing with may well be themselves in the future. Okay, so let me, let me try to wrap my head around this. It seems like Smith is saying that greed is good. I'm going to put that in the margin. Greed is good. Because if you act in your own self-interest, it ends up benefiting other people anyway. So if, if a city planner is trying to be as self-interested as possible to justify building a new railway line, eventually that will benefit the people that get to use that train. Or if someone retrains in order to maintain or get a higher salary, that's better for the marketplace at large because that means that their contribution to the workplace is more efficient or better somehow. So, okay, so that's what Smith is saying. Greed is good. It has societal benefits when individual people act in their own self-interest. The next paragraph. Instead of judging consequences... Okay, so Smith judged consequences. So we're looking at a counterpoint. This is a hinge of the, uh, of the article. Aristotle said ethics was about having the right character, displaying virtues like courage and honesty. Okay, so Aristotle is saying it's not that greed is good, it's, that the, it's the thought that counts. Let's keep reading at line 28. It is a view put into practice whenever business leaders are chosen for their good character. But it is a hard philosophy to teach just how much loyalty should you show to a manufacturer that keeps losing money. Show too little, and you're a greed-is-good corporate raider, there's our Adam Smith idea there, too much, and you're wasting money on unproductive capital. So here the author is questioning whether or not loyalty, for example, as a virtue, is one that is smart to maintain in business. If you have too little loyalty, you're basically evil, right? A greed-is-good corporate raider. And too much loyalty, and you might end up making bad business decisions. Let's continue at line 33. Aristotle thought there was a golden mean between the two extremes, an ideal middle between the two extremes, and finding it was a matter of fine judgment. But, let's circle that, but if ethics is about character, it's not clear what those characteristics should be. So here I think the author is trying to complicate Aristotle's idea. If it's the thought that counts, if it's character values that contribute to ethics, which are, which are those characteristics? Which are those virtues? Let's continue on at uh, line 38. There is yet another approach. Okay, so now we have, I would say, a third claim to ethics. So we've got, so far, we've got Adam Smith with greed is good. We've got Aristotle with it's the thought that counts. Now here comes idea number three. Instead of rooting ethics in character or the consequences of our actions, we can focus on our actions themselves. Okay, so let's recite. Let's say that in our own words. So instead of consequences, which is Adam Smith's, you know, the ends justify the means, greed is good ideology, and instead of Aristotle's virtue-focused, it's the thought that counts ideology, this third one is about the means by which something is accomplished, right? The way in which we're doing something. Let's focus on the actions themselves. So from this perspective, some things are right, some wrong. We should buy fair trade goods. We shouldn't tell lies and advertisements. Ethics becomes a list of commandments, a catalog of do's and don'ts. When a finance official refuses to devalue a currency because they have promised not to, they are defining ethics this way. According to this approach, devaluation can still be bad, even if it would make everybody better off. So I've read this paragraph, I'm going to recite what I think the point of it was, which is to say, the means are important, so focus on actions. Let's move on to paragraph 6. And in fact, actually, hold on, so, so if we remember from our survey step, question 5 was about the content of paragraph 5, What's the, what's the main point of paragraph five? If we wanted to, on test day, we could pop over, answer that question right now. But instead, let's move on to the next paragraph. Many moral dilemmas arise when these three versions pull in different directions, but clashes are not inevitable. Clashes, I remember I underlined in the previous video. We could, again, go over to the questions and answer that one straight off. I'm not going to here. I'm just demonstrating that we could. 
So, okay, so so through our active reading, we have pulled out three different strands of argument. Uh, the passage, very kindly, has agreed with us that there are three different arguments here. But clashes are not inevitable between those three ideas. So there's there's a point at which Aristotle, Adam Smith, and focus on actions can all agree. Take fair trade coffee. And we know from our earlier survey that fair trade coffee is what the graph is about. The graph is illustrating this idea. So what is fair trade coffee? Coffee that is sold with a certification that indicates the farmers and workers who produced it were paid a fair wage, for example. Buying it might have good consequences, be virtuous, and also be the right way to act in a flawed market. Good consequences, that's Adam Smith. Be virtuous, that's Aristotle. Be the right way to act, that's the ideology from a paragraph ago, the focus on actions. Common ground like this suggests that even without agreement on where ethics applies, ethical economics is still possible. So even though there are three different ideas in tension with each other about what ethical economics is, there are still places in the real world where all three of those ideas can exist in harmony. Let's keep going at line 57. Whenever we feel queasy about perfect competitive markets, the problem is often rooted in a phony conception of people. The model of man, they mean human, on which classical economics is based, an entirely rational and selfish being, is a parody, as John Stuart Mill, the philosopher who pioneered the model, accepted. Okay, so economics is based on a perfectly rational human being, this fictional human being that makes all of their decisions on the basis of self-interest and rationality doesn't exist, is a parody. Let's continue at 62. Most people, even economists, now accept that this economic man is a fiction. We behave like a herd. We fear losses more than we hope for gains. Rarely can our brains process all the relevant facts. So I think that a perfect competitive market, and the reason that we feel weird about it, that we feel queasy about it, is because it calls into question Adam Smith's idea about being self-interested. Is that self-interest ever truly rational? Because we know that human beings are not purely rational. Let's keep going. All right, final paragraph. These human quirks, right, referring back to the previous paragraph, uh, we're not rational. So these human quirks mean we can never make purely rational decisions. There we go. A new wave of behavioral economists, aided by neuroscientists, is trying to understand our psychology, both alone and in groups, so they can anticipate our decisions in the marketplace more accurately. But... Let me circle but. But psychology can also help us understand why we react in disgust at economic injustice, or accept a moral law as universal. Which means that the relatively new science of human behavior might also define ethics for us. Ethical economics would then emerge from one of the least likely places, economists themselves. So, ultimately, we have these three ideas. We've got Smith, we've got Aristotle, and we've got, let's just call it actions. So, rational self-interest, virtue, and moral actions. And all of these are now complicated by behavioral psychology, which I'm just going to call BEP. The author is saying in this final paragraph that behavioral economists and neuroscientists are going to use their, their science to help understand everything else why human beings behave the way that they do. And so this last line is kind of a, I guess it's kind of a joke at the expense of economists. Um, ethical economics would then emerge from one of the least likely places, economists themselves. I guess it's, they're trying to be ironic about the idea that since ideas like greed is good also came from economists, it seems weird that ethics would arise from them as well. Now, comprehending this irony, I don't think is necessary to answer any of these questions. I think that's just sort of a little bit of mild economist fun that the, uh, the author of the passage was having. All right, so we've read, we've recited. We already had a look at the graph during our survey step, uh, so I won't take a ton of time with it now. We saw that the graph compared the profits of fair trade coffee to the profits of non-fair trade coffee. And that's it, let's move on. So now it's time for us to review. What was this passage about? And in order to do that, let's, let's zoom out to take a look at the whole thing. And now with this view, and I know the text is quite small now, but in this view, we can see the, the shape of the arguments. So in this paragraph here, 
we're introducing the idea of Adam Smith. You can see my tiny little note that says greed is good. Here, we're introducing Aristotle, who says it's the thought that counts. And here, we've got the focus on actions. And these three ideas are all in tension with each other. In this paragraph, we see the idea of free trade coffee, which reconciles one, two, and three. And in these final two paragraphs, we introduce ideas that complicate claims one, two, and three on how human beings aren't rational actors in the first place. So now, I feel like I have a pretty solid handle on this passage, and I'm going to move on into the individual questions. Okay, so this video was like 16 minutes long, and you won't have that much time on test day to do the active reading step. However, the speed of your thought is going to be much faster than the speed of my voice spelling out my thoughts. And with focused practice, you'll get faster and faster still.